None. Great. Love that. Let me go ahead and introduce Jessica Brand. Jessica is with the Department of Neighborhoods with the City of Seattle. She's the outreach manager for the city, city's HAL initiative, uh, along with the mayor's office. She's going to give a short overview of HALA as it relates to West Seattle. She's going to speak about 20 minutes, then we're going for questions and answers. Take it away, Jessica. Okay. Thank you all for having me tonight um, and for making it very close to my own neighborhood so I can just pop back over the bridge. <laughs> um, so I'm going to do this sort of quickly. We're going to do questions at the end, but if something doesn't sound right or you're not understanding, you know, please feel free to pop in. Um, so I, I like to start with this slide um, to sort of not just remind us of where, of how far we've come as a community on the big issues that are, that are facing us, right? So as Seattle is growing and changing, um, we have really started to double down or triple down in lots of places on transit and transit investments. And so that's a community need that we were like, we came together as a community and said we need to make change for this. Same with um, pre-K, uh, parts district, and also roads and safety projects. So I just like to sort of start with that because I think that is really where the housing affordability conversation sort of started. It was there are a lot of things that we're tackling as a community, but as we're moving forward, we're realizing that there is a big place that is sort of not, or a big problem that's not being addressed, and that's the housing crisis. So 2,800 people are living without shelter, and that is more than we've seen in, in recent history. Uh, over 45,000 people in Seattle are paying over half of their income in housing. So that really narrows the amount that you can spend on other things. And this is a trend that we are seeing over time grow and grow. I think the other, the other thing is that average rents for a one-bedroom house has increased in Seattle by 29% over the last five years. So if you are somebody who has lived in Seattle for a while, uh, you are experiencing a ton of change. And so... Um, you know, every time that uh, anyone from the city would go out and talk with folks, any time that you were probably around the table with some of your friends, you know, you're having these kinds of conversations. What are we going to do about transportation? What are we going to do about parks and access to open space? And what are we going to do about this affordability crisis? So what the mayor did after hearing from, from you all over and over again <laughs> about this crisis um, was he really brought... He brought um, Group of, uh, a group of people together around a hollow vision, which is a multi-pronged approach to deliver more housing choices. So this is really, I just want to stress this for a minute, that this is not something that we are saying is a crisis and we're going to do one thing about it, or a crisis and we're going to do two things about it. When it is th at this level, we really need to hit it at a lot of different levels. And so it is multi-pronged, and it really is a, commi a shared commitment between developers, residents, businesses, nonprofits, to support construction and preservation of affordable housing. Um, so where we've been. So we had a Housing Affordability and Livability Advisory Committee. And we are going to keep HALA. I tried my hardest to try to come up with some other name. But this is the name that it was given. And this is the name that many people know it by. Um, so there was a 28-member advisory committee. They met from November to July. Um, Cindy was actually served on that advisory committee. So. <laughs> As she serves you, she also served on this committee. Um, and then when the recommendations were sort of starting to get finalized from this committee, they went out and had a, you know, sort of a robust survey of, and talked to 2,700 people. They released their action plan on July 13th. The mayor then released his action plan, or they released their recommendation, sorry, and the mayor released his action plan. And then we've really started since then some the beginnings of some community conversations. And I just want to stress that we are talking for HALA implementation, we are talking about into 2017 and maybe even beyond because of the raw number of programs that we're talking about and the raw number of changes that could be expressed through these programs. The goal is 50,000 units in the next 10 years. That's 30,000 market rate and 20,000 affordable. Um, this is, this is, a huge amount. I mean, this is a really, it's record breaking. Um, and I think it's interesting because a lot of people ask right off the top, you know, what are other cities doing to address this? Or what are, you know, how, how are we doing sort of best practices from what's happening around the country? And I think there, 
many of our peer cities are sort of feeling the crunch and not doing what they needed to be doing before it became a, a huge crisis. And we're trying to get out in front of it. So the HALA report was, um, or the action plan, has really four buckets. And there are a lot of recommendations and um, practical applications within those four buckets. I'm going to talk about them really sort of high level. And what I want to be able to tell you today is that um, as we span out over the next couple of years and have these conversations, I am really committed to making sure that you know this is the thing you need to focus on right now. <laughs> We're not going to talk about that for a little while, so you don't need to focus on that, because I think what that will do is that will allow people to sort of weigh in at the appropriate times on the appropriate things um, that, we're, that we're sort of moving through the legislative cycle. Um, that doesn't preclude us from having conversations about how these things are shaped, but it does, because it's so confusing, I got a lot of feedback from community members in the last couple of months that was like, we need a one-on-one -on -one book. We need to know how we can even like approach this big thing because there's a lot going on. And so over the months working with community, I said, you know, what would work for you? And they said, just tell us what we need to focus on and when we can comment and when it'll make impact on that piece of legislation. And that is what I'm attempting to do here. So we have the four buckets, invest in housing for those most in need. This is the housing levy, the big bucket that we're talking about right now. The month of February, we are going to be going to a number of communities, uh, West Seattle will be one of them, to get feedback on the housing levy. So we have passed this a number of times. This is what the city has done over the last, I think, 25 years. Um, it's been successfully building affordable housing, and um, it needs to be renewed this year. So we have to have the conversation about what kinds of programs need to go in it, how big should it be, what should it be focused on, those are all the kinds of conversations we're going to be having this year. Um, and then creating new affordable housing as we grow. This is the requirement, um, or could be a requirement, it's still a proposal at this point, but this is the new program that would require developers as they build in multifamily and commercial to contribute to new affordable housing. So every new unit or every new building would be contributing to affordable housing. This is that program, and I'll get a little more into detail on it, but um, that will require some land use zoning changes to implement. The other is preventing displacement and fostering equitable communities. This is really where we're hitting it on strengthening tenant protections, right? You can do a lot um, within state law and within city code to do a better job of making sure that people can stay in their homes um, and also that they are not seeing the kinds of regular increases. Um, and then promote efficient and innovative development. This is really, and I know this comes as a little bit of a shock and surprise to you guys, but sometimes government can get in the way. And so, <laughs> so this is us really saying, like, what is it that we're doing that's impeding affordable housing? What is it that we're doing with our processes, right? You know, and we set them up over time. Um, this is, you know, where design review fits. This is where um, some of the historic preservation stuff. And so we really are saying it's not just about, like, what can happen in the community, but what it, what are all, what's our role in that, too. All right. So I just wanted to quickly go into mandatory housing affordability because that is really the big program that we're kind of talking about right now. Um, as a community. And so this is intended to roll out first um, in South Lake Union and downtown. And so some of these slides are sort of focused on that, but I will try to bring them to West Seattle if, if I can. So really this is just talking very briefly because sometimes people start with the question of like what are the other development fees that we're already charging for development. So we are already charging transportation fees, streetscape improvements, utility improvements, <coughs> child care, open space, historic preservation, farm and forest preservation. Those are all through incentive zoning. And we are in a parallel track considering impact fees. And impact fees, as you may or may not know, are fees charged on development, but they are state required to only go to certain things. So it's transportation, parks and open space, um, schools, and fire, I think. Possibly. Possibly fire, but don't quote me on that one. Um, but affordable housing is not in that bucket. So impact fees is something we are looking at, though, in a parallel track to figure out what the role of those might be as we move forward with some of these programs. So mandatory housing affordability program, 
is a new program that creates affordable housing as we grow. As I said, it's a multifamily commercial. And yeah. So I think the thing that I, <laughs> I'm like looking at, I think I already said all this. Um, but I think the one thing that um, I want to make sure that people understand is that during the process, during the HALA process, as we were having conversations um, within the technical advisory groups, within the community, within the legal community, um, we were really looking at ways in which we could make new development contribute to affordable housing. Like that was the end goal. And um, there were several ideas sort of floated before, but in a scan of what was happening in our surrounding areas, we found the, the mandatory housing affordability program. So in Issaquah and Federal Way and Kirkland. And what it requires by via state law is that you give capacity, so some development capacity. In some places it can be taller buildings, in some places it could be wider buildings. In some places it could mean taking away some code requirement that doesn't allow you to maximize the space in some way. So what that means is you give something to a developer and then you extract <laughs> that right back into a, the affordable housing program. And so that is really what we're talking about with mandatory housing affordability. What I will say is that we are much further along in South Lake Union and downtown in understanding the implications of that. What, what kind of proposals we would want to put forward for buildings, um, what kinds of, of setbacks we would need, like what kind of view corridor, you know, all those kinds of things because we've planned there recently, they've gone under environmental review recently. We are not there in the neighborhood context. Like, it, I will just say, we have, we're still having conversations about that um, and what we will be doing in the next six months is really sort of preparing for that. So we are going to, we are looking to do the downtown South Lake Union and the select neighborhoods is really the neighborhoods that we have been doing planning processes in for the last three to four years. So the university district is part of that. They've had a four year planning process for their um, urban village. Uh, 23rd and University, similar, they've had, or 23rd and Union has had a similar planning process for three years. Those are the select neighborhoods. We should probably just list them out, but so it doesn't look like other neighborhoods. We're looking at that in 2016, and then the remaining areas we're not talking about until 2017. And it is a commitment of ours that we will have the conversations in the communities. And so I will get into sort of the robust outreach plan that we're talking about. But if we pass the mandatory housing affordability residential structure, is what it's called here, or framework, or the basis for this program today, let's just say, which we're not, but if we were, it would not go into effect or be implemented until we had zoning conversations, until we had the trade-off conversation, which again is going to be in 2000, you know, 2017. I think, that, well, the decision will be made somewhere in 2017 if we move forward with it or we don't. I think what we need to understand is that there was some really, some thoughtful thinking and some principles behind why they thought this was a good idea. But as we have this conversation over the next year, it's up to us, just like everything else that we've done in the past several years, decades, to make Seattle great. It really is up to us to have that conversation. Is that a trade-off we're willing to make? Is it not? If it isn't, what does that mean in the long run? If we decide to do nothing, we will probably see the trends that we are seeing now, right? Affordability becomes harder. If we do some of them, you know, small things, it might stem it a little bit. If we do big things, we might have a shot at this. So we have to really think about that and come together. And I think we are super powerful and smart and good at solving these problems. So I have no doubt we can do it, but I really want to make sure that you guys know I'm counting on you <laughs> to help us get there. So the principles behind this are they wanted to get 6,000 affordable units. So they did a modeling across the city. Um, they want to target households between less than 60% AMI, which is 38,000 for one person and 54,000 for a family of four. I'm fairly new to housing, so I didn't know these AMI numbers, so I make them write them up all the time because I think it's really interesting to think two, sing, uh, you know, two parents working minimum wage barely gets you to 60%, you know? So if you're thinking about what that looks like, that's it's starting to take away some of the folks that 
that I think are really valuable neighbors, right? And, and limiting them to being able to live here. Um, encouraging a mix of performance and payment. So commercial buildings don't build residential, so, so they can't build on site. But we are really hoping and writing this, the program, the goal of the program is to make sure that when they're building residential that they're building it on site. So that is a goal that is baked into this. And then it's also going to be, um, it's, as I said before, it's going to apply broadly, but we really do need to be smart about how it applies. And if there are long-standing, and this is mostly around South Lake Union, but they just had an eight-year conversation where they talked about stepping down towards the water as a value, and they wrote that into the codes. I think we need to not make the community have that conversation again, but just sort of go in knowing that that was a conversation we had, and let's build on it. Let's not start new. You know, let's like let's build on the on the decades or more information that we have with folks. And then I think the next thing I just want to say is it's my job um, to make sure that this feels like a very robust community conversation and that people are having a lot of opportunities to weigh in. So I really put this, the proposals and the plans plus the community engagement, really that's how we equal meeting the affordability crisis, right? I don't have one without the other. Um, and so I, just full disclosure, I have a nonprofit background. Um, so. I don't just do one meeting and think that's going to be enough. You know, we have to get people sort of where they are and get the information that we need. We also need to be honest about what can be impacted. You know, if there are legal requirements, we have to tell the community that's a legal requirement. We can't fuss with that. But we can change these over here. So let's focus on how we make it all work together as a good package. On Tuesday, January 26th, which is next Tuesday, um, we are going to have Hala is presented at Seattle at Work. Seattle at Work is a, I don't know if you guys know that, it's a mayor's driven um, sort of community engagement tool um, where they bring all of the resources of the Seattle Municipal Tower, so bus passes and, you know, uh, 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 signing up for utilities, all that stuff, to one place. And um, we're going to kind of take it over. <laughs> we're going to tell people what we're doing in the next few months around Hala. And that includes, so the mandatory housing affordability in South Lake Union downtown. I'm really specific about that because, as I said, we're not quite ready to have the neighborhood conversation. Um, but the mandatory housing affordability program does have baked in it some principles that I think people need to understand and buy into. Are these the principles that we want this program, you know, to, to say? And so that's the conversation we'll be having now. Source of income discrimination. This one I'm like sort of baffled by, but like if you're a woman who works part time and you have um, uh, child support as another part of your income, you can actually be discriminated discriminated against um, based on your income. Same thing with Social Security. So it's a really interesting thing. I'm learning all sorts of things. So we're going to tackle that. We're going to see what can we do to make sure that some of the folks, elderly women, are not disproportionately hitting barriers to, uh, to housing. As I said, the housing levy renewal, and then tenant protections. I don't know if you guys saw it, but it was actually really close to my neighborhood. But there was a YouTube video with that awful housing conditions with the cockroaches, and it was like everything was happening, and the rents were going up. And so we really do need to, to, to strengthen those tenant protections so people feel like they've got a good quality way of life. January 31st, February 2nd, and 4th, we're going to have three telephone town halls. These are place, These are us calling you in your home uh, via a list that we have bought, not that you have to opt into, but so that we can really start to get more people to the conversation. And this will be an hour long. You can ask questions of the mayor. There will be other people on the line. Um, we're doing it one in north, south, and central. And then the month of February, we're really going to go into, we have five communities that we're going to go into. And one of the things that Cindy... Um, and Deb, who is so great, I am asking communities to come together because I have two children <laughs> and I want, I want to talk with all of you, but I also want to see them grow up. So I am so excited that you all came together. I'm asking other neighborhoods to do that as well because if I have to go to every meeting individually, my poor kids are never going to see me again. Um, and, and plus, you know, I mean, like, how great am I that I, you know, like, <laughs> you don't want to so see me that, you don't want to see me that often unless you yeah, yeah. Uh, 
And then we're really, in March, we're going to do another sort of citywide conversation. And the idea here is that we have community conversations, and then we pop out to the city as a whole through a lot of different methods and verify what we're hearing. So here's what we're hearing overall on the housing level here. Here's what we're hearing overall on this. Does this feel right? Are we getting there? And uh, we're going to do that kind of mode throughout the year. So it may be quite possible that you miss it completely by 2017, but I am certainly hoping that you were. it was because you were under a rock and not because you were interested and we just didn't hit you. So <laughs> my, that's my hope. That's my commitment to you guys. Um, Hollow website will actually be launched somewhere in the January 26th. I'm like fighting with the city web at this point. Um, but I am also hoping that that's a one-stop shop as well. It gives you all the detail you could ever want to know, but it also gives you where they're going to be next week. So if you decided you want to go to another neighborhood to hear this, because you haven't heard it for a while. So that's it. Awesome. Great. Thanks for having me. We've got some time now for questions and answers. And can I get an idea of how many people have questions? Just raise your hand. One, a handful? Okay. Really? Excellent. Can I just also say right, really quickly, like I really take it seriously that my job is to communicate with you guys, so please call me or email me. I will get back to you. Did you bring your cards? I did. That would be a trick, right, if I didn't bring my cards. Whoa, what card? <laughs> they don't give us Yeah. All right. So Jessica's cards will be over there. Yeah. And uh, I've asked our recording secretary to kind of keep tabs on what the questions are that we may not be able to grasp the entire answer, but we'll at least get all your questions. So again, let's start on this side, uh, at the wall, with uh, your questions. And I apologize for pointing or saying man in dark uh, puffy jacket, but that's how. <laughs> man in dark puffy jacket, you're first. Um, at the beginning of the presentation, you mentioned um, our city. Is our city considered in crisis? Were you saying Seattle's in crisis? That's what we're hearing overwhelmingly from what is the, what are the peer cities that you're looking at and where are they dealing with that position of crisis? Who are they? So, um, we look at a lot of different cities for a lot of different metrics, but I think, you know, as we've seen in the last year or two years, we're, we're now being compared to San Francisco and New York and, uh, you know, and sort of the housing affordability thing. I think we're also, though, communicating with cities around the region um, to talk about, like, well, what does it mean when Seattle becomes unaffordable? What does that mean for your city adjacent to it or next door? Um, you know, what does that look like? So we're having a lot of conversations about, with, with cities, generally speaking. And I will say that, uh, you know, as we started having these community conversations about, you know, really about pre-K and about transportation, housing affordability, like, was mentioned at almost every one. And when we do sort of how are we doing kind of polls, it's always neck and neck with transportation. So we're doing all of it, if that makes sense. Okay. Uh, so, was that your one question or? No. Okay. Because <laughs> <laughs> remember, sure, we'll, we'll come back and know. Anyone else along the wall here? <laughs> all right, Ginny, we've got a question from you. The Hala, uh, the Hala panel. Yeah. Um, so they were there were a number of them. So there were 28. They represented um, community groups. They represented um, private developers. They represented nonprofit developers. Um, as I said, we had you know sort of the neighborhood representation. Um, there were also folks who serve underrepresented communities um, that were on that. Um, there were also uh, folks whose job is to sort of understand math and economics and that sort of thing. So it was a broad range of expertise. Um, but I do think that that was a good starting point and a good sort of technical advisory group. And I think what we need to figure out is, of the, of the things that they recommended, what are the things that we want to take up? Okay. 28 people. That's a lot. Are they on the website? They yeah, I think so. They're on the mayor's. They're on the website? They're somewhere. 
that, you know, if you Google around, there's a couple of links. Yeah. The documents from all the, that they released are all yeah. still on the website. And yeah, no, they're definitely the, public. Is that through the mayor's there, yeah. link on the City yeah. of Seattle website? You go to the to mayor's face, click yeah. on it, and then you'll find all those as subtopics. So I think it's <laughs> murray-seattle.gov slash housing. When I'm done with this, it'll be seattle.gov slash holla, and it'll be so much more clear, but I think that it should be there. If not, email me, and I'll get you a list of them. Anyone else over here with a question? Diane, and then we'll go to Tamsin. Uh, Air question. Airbnb is making it very clear that they're getting ready to go into contract with some of the biggest multifamily, the Equity Residential and the Avalon Residential, to turn apartments into lodging. They've already invaded a lot of our local here in every neighborhood. Um, when I read the original report, I think I saw like one line about, you know, we're going to charge taxes or something. Is there anything, if we don't do something, they're going to take over all of our housing so we can build our way out of it. Yeah. Is there anything in the plan to be proactive or defensive at all about what's happening with Airbnb taking over our housing? Did everyone hear that question about Airbnb and housing? Yes. I think basically okay. it was just a concern about Airbnb and the amount of the market that they're sort of eating up with short-term rental as opposed to long-term rental. Is that sort well, of and they, they, I follow a lot of business news with the multifamily market, and right. they are getting ready to go into contract with right. the largest multifamily corporations in the country to turn their apartments, a certain portion of their okay. apartments, into lodging. Yeah. Um, so I think the short answer is no. no. <laughs> um, but I think the longer answer is this is what happens when the market gets innovative, right? We have to, we as regulators sort of catch up with them. And so it's definitely a conversation that is happening. Other cities are also, oh. Yeah, we know uh, some of the council members have been looking at this and so, um, O'Brien's staff has, we, I belong on another committee that's also looking right. at this. So they're starting a dialogue of whether they need to do this. So if you have right. concerns, this is why we do this. Send it to the mayor, send it to the council members saying, I have a concern about this topic, please, you know, take a look at it. Yay, yay. Yeah, Let and I think, I, think that's the, I think that's the thing. I think the conversation is happening. I think other cities are starting to coalesce around what it is that we want to do around this. Our city San Francisco has been doing it for years. Right. We're way behind. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. So, okay, very good. Tamsin. Um, I had a question about the MHA program. Yes. Has the legislation been passed already to deal with that, or will we be waiting for legislation to pass in, in order to do the things that you, they came up with that need to be done for, like, tax incentives or giving taller or wider buildings to developers? And won't that take legislation to do that? Yes. So the, the framework for the commercial program. And again, I'll just say that the program itself requires all of that. And there's, Nick, who's here from the OPCD, probably has the name of the piece of code that it goes into. But it's a piece of code that says, we intend to do this program and here's what it looks like. So the commercial did pass last fall. The residential is the conversation we're having right now. How do we want to implement it? And I think I just want to make sure that people understand it is two step as two step process. So the commercial framework was passed last year, but it is not implemented. We are not getting anything from new commercial development that's happening right now because we have to talk about zoning changes. We have to talk about what that trade off is. And so until that conversation happens and the city council approves it, we can't start charging fees. And so South Lake Union is intended, South Lake Union downtown, International District, Pioneer Square, they're intended to go first with this conversation, and it would be both residential and commercial, but until that conversation is completed and the city council has approved it, we don't, we can't collect fees because it's not a program yet. And nothing retroactively. No, I asked that question, actually. I was like, oh, what about, like, you know, and, and it was because of the way the legal framework is it needs to look it doesn't need to look like it needs to actually be <laughs> and so I, I had this I had a similar question which which bears in mind then for folks who are wondering about this projects that are under construction now are grandfathered into the codes that we have they have not and if something opens up at, or, and it pulls a permit even they're vested to those old codes until the codes change so all 
this building right now. So right. So we're not. So well, what I will say though is that um, given that it, it, you're absolutely correct, but given that it is on the horizon, there's nothing to sort of preclude us from asking them there you to go. participate. So <laughs> voluntarily. Question, uh, woman yeah, right. to back. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Shane. Was, well, Why is it still protruding um, info about the traffic calling? Is Jim Curtin still going to contact person? For, For the road safety stuff. Yes. Great okay. right, guy. Yeah. Anyone else on this side for a question? Yes, ma'am. Um, yes, one of the, your points are tenant protections, which I think is great. I do have a concern, though, that someone that is renting out a portion of their own property, rather than a guy that owns, you know, a thousand unit apartment building, gets treated the same way as a as an owner of a property that. Is there anything in that you're looking at to protect that small person that's maybe trying to save their home by renting out part of it? Yeah. Uh, to not be treated the same way as a guy that has a huge apartment building. This is going to be a very unsatisfying answer. I don't know. I can look, yeah. I can definitely I get back to you. It's okay. yeah. actually not considered, and that's why I bring yeah. it up. Yeah. No, I think, it, I think it's a fair point. And I'm happy. Can I get you back the answer and yes. you can forward it to her? You bet. Yeah, that's great. Okay, we'll move back here. Let's start from the back and uh, the turquoise top. You man with the bun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we talked about guys, the 28 member committee. Who are the 50 plus stakeholders that were referenced? Who were the Hollis stake? The 50 state Hollis stakeholders. So what they did is they sort of, so they had like 28 folks that met very regularly, and then they started to get really detailed and really technical, and so they brought in other people to help them get into the weeds. And so I, I before this, I actually um, helped staff the planning commission, and we had this one guy on there that was like so technical, and he actually served on a technical advisory committee. So it was really those folks that were like, really smart about the programs, how they'd been implemented other places, and got into the details of it. It's a little harder than the other gentleman. I think it's the same question then. Is it a term for both of these? Is it a fixed term, or they're on, and they're on this committee going forward? No, the committee is disbanded. It doesn't exist. So it's a short, it's a short, yeah. Huh? The 50, the same 50 plus stakeholders, the ones that are going to be advising for this whole process going forward, or is it only an introduction? It was only during the recommendation phase. No, now we're we're all advising. So I'm going to do politics here. Yeah. That's why we put this meeting together because now it's to the community. It's right? your and yeah. and it's so hard to get people to come out to a meeting like this. I admire all of you for going. Oh, this is a really boring topic, but I'll come anyway. But so and it's you can see it's like going to be a two-year process. So it's figuring out how we stay engaged, figuring out what are your issues. You know, not every issue is everybody's issue. But be, make this a, aware so that you don't wake up in two years and go, what? So, so this is really, you know, and we'll keep trying to do this. We, we'll have try and just get her out here for the whole West Seattle community. You bet. So that you guys can stay engaged because it is, it is the people who come to the table who have the voice. And you That's can... Right. You can bet that there's other special interest groups at the table. So we're the advocates for the community. We're the neighborhood voice. special group. Yeah. Good question. Uh, go ahead. I, I just wanted to point out that uh, when the Green Factor was enacted in 2008, that eliminated the uh, requirement that it was all over plant trees on a construction site and shifted the tree planting out into the parking strip, which is off site. Mm -hmm. And then so, so that was in 2008. And then later on, the uh, low-rise uh, multifamily code was rewritten to reduce setback <coughs> to seven feet from the property line, which you cannot have a tree planted between the property line and the building seven feet away, because there isn't room for a tree. Mm -hmm. So uh, my question with Pala is, um, haven't the developers already got enough? <laughs> <laughs> Great question. No, I don't know. I mean, I think it's uh, I, it's interesting. I'm, I'm like getting a, a code 101 each time I have these conversations. So that's why I write some of this stuff down. 
Um, I do think, you know, over the years we've given for certain things, right? Green Factor is one of them, and we, we do have sort of this tweaking of the code for the values that those represent. We wanted to capture that value, and so we did something in return for it. I think, though, that it really is, a, that's a question I would pose back to us, right? I think as we start to have this conversation, there are going to be areas of the city, um, you know, like, low rise, for instance, um, where there are going to be strong feelings about like how that looks and how that feels. And I think we have to have the conversation in tandem for what it's going to take to make that feel like a livable place. It would be the, a conversation if you would just answer the question, but well, where will the tree go if it doesn't have to be planted on a construction site and the building is seven feet from the property line? Where will the tree go? Those are good questions, Michael, and I don't, and she was saying, we don't know, but those are questions that we need to have answered in the larger picture. But I think other questions have come up that are similar to that, and I, you know, like the, the building materials or the frontage and all those sorts of things. And I think those are conversations we're going to have to fi figure out, and if we're not willing to give on that one, but we are on this one, then let's, you know, we're going to have to work together to figure it out. So I don't have the answer. I don't write the code, but I'm happy to put you in. I, I think the so answer is down. to change the comp plan to eliminate the environment component and, and say that, that uh, the, the ecology is no longer important in our city and that housing is what's important. Michael, I'm going to move on. Good points, uh, sir. Yep. And then we'll go back to uh, sure. Jim. Uh, my, my question was, uh, the zoning that probably is going to be changing, is that going to be limited to the urban villages? And I know some of the urban villages are thinking about, I think they're going to do it in an admiral and expanding. I don't think Morgan's going to be expanding, but I'm assuming I can limit those zoning changes to the urban villages or not? Or is it going to go outside the urban villages? So two questions in there. <laughs> so one is the provisional boundaries for the comprehensive plan. And um, so they rolled out the provisional boundary expansions. I don't know which ones are, are sort of talked about in West Seattle. None for Morgan. None for Morgan. So but I think about anything else for Morgan. <laughs> but I think West Seattle Junction might have a little. Junction um, has some, some squishy things going on, as does. Admiral, uh, no. Admiral, no. No? Delridge? I, I think, I think I it was think just I, West Seattle. I heard Mike. Oh, okay. No. Okay. So anyways, I will just say that that conversation was unrolled through the comprehensive plan, and what we heard at both ends was tie, tra uh, tie transit to increase development. That's a thing we want you to do. And the other thing was... What's Hala going to do to that stuff inside there? You know, what's the changes that we should expect? We want to know that, too. And so I think what we heard that. So you, that, if that was what you said, we heard it. Um, and I think what we're talking about now is really slowing down the boundary conversation to coincide with HALA so that we know what's happening inside those boundaries. But specific to your other point, yeah. you should have brought the map, the MHI map. <laughs> because there's a map on the website that shows the urban villages, so it's definitely inside the urban yes. villages. No, no a it's a citywide. And then it shows, uh, this is under consideration for mostly the, f the frequent transit corridors. Mm -hmm. So California for sure. So if this goes in, those zoning changes would happen in all those places shown on that map. So that should encourage you to go look at the map. And what yeah, is so I will say, I'm sorry, what, what she's talk? talking about, the commercial. What does it mean? What does the acronym mean? Mandatory inclusionary. Well, yeah. see, I. She's old school on I'm the old terminology. School. I'm on the Holla Committee, we called it Mizu. So I've had to change the name seven times as they won't get so new what? acronyms. Well, so it's just mandatory housing affordability. It's the program that about. we're talking about implementing. Yeah. I will say that within urban villages, the places we've said that, you know, over the last 20 years through the conference plan, we want to grow there, there is single family in there, right? It is not all mid-rise, low-rise, whatever. And so the, the conversation is that we would grow in those areas, which would mean changes. The other places that we are talking about this impacting is going to be anywhere where there is already multifamily and commercial, right? So uh, the corridors, basically, as Cindy said. So it's sort of twofer, but I just wanted to make sure that you guys knew that, that we did hear 
loud and clear that, that those were two unknowns that the, that the community didn't feel comfortable going forward with. And then as we're having the zoning conversations around the HALA trade-off, or the mandatory housing affordability trade-off, we're going to have to talk about what happens in those urban villages. Um, as we've said over the last 20 plus years, those are the places we want to grow. Um, but there are a lot of zoning types on the books that we don't use, and so the question is, does it all have to go to the ones we've been using, or are there other options? Um, so it's a conversation. Pam in the black sweater. Um, I realize that Holla is still a proposal, but when it first came out, there were a couple of concerns that mm -hmm. I'm, curious, I'm, I'm curious whether they're still on the books or not. Um, obviously, homelessness has come to the top, yeah. and, and as it should. Um, I'm curious if Sharia law accommodations are still part of that, the conversation <coughs> to Muslim home buyers. Just want to make sure that we understand that Christian and Jewish scripture also includes not paying, or sorry, not charging interest, but there's no conversation about actually paying interest. And I hope the city is, realizes there are Muslim banks that can do these things that will still make it okay in terms of their religious law without giving preference to one tradition over the rest of us who don't want to pay interest either. That's the first thing. The second thing um, I want to know about on the landlord. Is this your second question? It's part of these okay, two things I want to know if they're still part go of the quick. conversation. Um, the, I, I'm certainly interested in protections to tenants, but there was talk about loosening up the restrictions on felons, and I want to know is that still part of the conversation? How's that going to impact? Okay. Got to I can do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so the Sharia law um, is actually, it is still part of the recommendations. But it is, the recommendation was to investigate best practices so that if people came to us and asked us how we could do that, and to create a report. Okay. And so we are going to roll that out shortly. Um, <clears throat> but not to get into the business of lending ourselves. Right. Um, and then to the second point, uh, yes, criminal background checks, or criminal barriers by criminal, mm -hmm. I can't remember how, what mm -hmm. we're calling it. That is actually a conversation that is starting now, but it is starting in a sort of a technical advisory kind of a way to figure out, again, what are best practices for other cities that are doing it. I know there's gonna be a lot of conversation about that, mm -hmm. particular to, um, how they um, make sure that people are compliant. And, it, and so there's a lot of stuff still to be had there. And in March, when we come out for the, the first sort of next big citywide conversation, we are definitely going to be rolling out what we're thinking, you know, where we're at on that, and then, you know, asking for feedback. So that's a, a step two process, but it's still on there. Because certainly a landlord would want the right to not to an arsonist, okay. for instance. Sorry, right. I'm going to move on. Jim, right. you've been patient. Yeah. You mentioned you're charging fees for developing, development right now. Where can I get a copy of those fees and the rate and what the schedule is for? And for the other you, fees that the developers are paying? Right. Do you know that, Nick? Nick, talk louder. So it's the other All development contributions, is my guess, right? So list that she had MSG. This, this one right here, right? Transportation, street case, right. scrapes, yeah, improvements. The fees are, you know, where, where, where the fees are, how they're set and established, and where they set and where they go to. So Jim, um, Jessica, we can get you Jim's contact information if you write Jim Gunther on your thing, and we can get that to you, Jim, OK? Right. And I guess the other question is... You're only, we're doing one now. Questions. And I will say that I, what my, what I will say is to that answer is that they are going to be collected by different entities, right? So SDOT's going to do it, Utilities is going to do it. No, totally, but it won't okay. be one place. Who else, uh, sir, in the back okay. with the glasses. How are you defining affordable housing? Oh, great oh, question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and so uh, this is where it gets a little bit... Weedy, so stick with me. Um, you do zero to thirty percent. You do thirty to sixty percent. So it's based on. Go back to your slide. Yeah. Name my slide. It's based on area median income. Where did I have that? Do we remember? Right there. 
So it's based on area median income. So the area median income based on a person, a one per household, two household, three household. It's a, it's a standard that is set by HUD. There you go. Um, and so basically what it does is it sort of looks at where we sit. So it is different for each city, each region. You know, it, it looks different. So there are a number of programs that um, we are talking about bolstering or improving that sort of get at the homeless to, to very low income. There are other programs that we are trying to target, the 30 to 60 percent, which is maybe some, someone's working, but they might be underemployed or they might be working at a low wage job. Um, and then there are very few, but maybe a couple more things for the 60 to 80 percent. So, um, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, we've got 10 minutes left. Are there other, do you want to so I will, this? Yeah, so I will just say that, that the programs will be hitting different areas of that because people at those different affordability but, levels but, have different. But of the 20,000 units that you build, or whatever the part is, 6,000, how do you say this is now affordable, that mm -hmm. this unit is, meets our goal of being affordable? So they're required to be affordable? Okay, let me, Again. Let, me, let me do it. So, in the mayor's target, he said he gave the Holland Committee a challenge. I want you to figure out a way to create 20,000 units affordable, which basically means subsidized housing, right? And then there's he wants 30,000 at market rate, which is like as cheap as the market will bear. So, she's talking about the 20,000, and then the Holland Committee said the 65 recommendations we've given you include funding for X number, I think it was 6,000 at zero to 30 AMI. So the, the ones where the nonprofit organizations would come in and they would be heavily subsidized units. Then there was 8,000 in 30 to 60 range. So those people would make right about that 38,000 and that, that rent that would be charged would take up one third of their income, right? Okay, one that's third. what I'm getting. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And then the other 60, 80. So the way it's protected in that 20,000 is the people who participate in this program say, I will guarantee that rent rate, and, and it's tweaked yearly by HUD, but I will guarantee that 60% AMI for the next 50 years. Five zero. Yeah. Five and zero then they years. have to, the city has to report them and track them and if a tenant moves out, the, uh, the rent can't go up above that 60%. So it's okay, so how many are left here for questions? One, go ahead. Quick technical question. And this slide <laughs> actually is illustrative of the question. So HUD uses median. Why does the city, why does Cala insist on using average? Because average is a very skewed figure. Mm -hmm. If you, here's a good illustration. You have so we're 20, using 20, median. 20, 20, well, you said, the average the average rent in Seattle is the average rent in Seattle is the first size. Oh, okay. If you have uh, 100 people in a room who make thirty thousand dollars a year, that's the average. If Bill Gates walks in the room, suddenly the average is six million dollars a year. Yes. Median is a much better figure, fifty percent above, fifty percent below. Okay. It seems to me that by using an average, you're sort of <coughs> goosing the crisis. You're creating the crisis. That's a, a fair point. Um, so why do, they cons why do they insist on continuing to use average rather than median? And I, I don't, I don't know. To be honest with you, I don't know. I think it, that those, those, that slide is intended to be illustrative. It's intended to show. So you know, I, 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 I can I'm ask. I'm not saying there isn't a crisis of sorts. I think the city, I think Ed Murray in particular, is interested in goosing the crisis. Okay. Good. Any more questions on this side? All right, we're going to go back over here because we've got 10 minutes, where nine where, minutes. Where does the city get the subsidy uh, funds? That's going to make up um, the gentleman's you know, answer over there. If, if, where are the subsidy money? Where's the money, subsidy money coming from? For, for any city. any subsidized yeah. development? So,
gets built basically from tax credit money. Which they sell tax credits to an investor, which is a bank, so it's kind of like a tax shelter from the back in the 80s. So mm -hmm. that's how this stuff gets built. Um, but affordable housing to like maintain it is difficult because the buildings don't usually generate money because they're affordable housing, so maintenance is an issue. Um, the money comes from different places. So sometimes HUD, sometimes Section 8. Um, okay. There's one more, one more I'm missing. The levy also and participates. The, yeah, the levy, and then there's a mix in the building too. Like certain buildings have different mixes of incomes. So some some people living in a building could could be paying not market rate, but close close to it, mm -hmm. and then other people based on their income. And there's a mix of number of people. It's a balancing act, mm -hmm. sir. So that we caught that question. Did you have a question that you wanted no, to comment, ma'am? In the pink. I might have missed it. What is the target date? Ten years, starting. I think we're starting to count January first, two thousand fifteen. Right? You asked that 15? question. Two thousand last year. Right? Last, last year. Nine years into it. We did have a question. So one thing to keep in mind: six thousand is a lot of units. So a building like some of the buildings that are being built right now, and um, you know, right in West Seattle, off the front mm -hmm. like I, I'm not sure exactly how many units are in those buildings, but the Hundreds. one that's coming out of the ground right now, the framing, is probably at the most. Up by 200 units. The building across the street that has a gym in it that's, that just opened, I think it's 100 units. So no, it's more 6, than 6,000, is it? Yeah. Okay. The 6,000 units is a lot of building. Those have multiple, I, I want to say uh, Whitaker is in the 300 range. Okay. okay. Anyway, there's thousands we built of units, right? 500 units. Okay. So that answered your question. <laughs> Was, did someone else back there have another question? Ma'am in the gray. Yeah, just uh, the question about the 38,000 and 54. Is that before or after? The, that's that's gross. Gross. That's income or gross. Your income? That's gross. Income. I would guess gross. it's gross, gross. yeah. Gross. So Sorry. Not, not money you actually have to right. spend. Not no. Right. Okay. okay. Other questions here on this? You guys have so many, like, yeah. in the way you know, detailed Joe. questions. I'm going to be learning from this. Joe. Yeah, when I'm, I'm driving around and I see a lot of these, like, Talk louder. building. I, when I drive around, I see a lot of buildings that are boarded up and they have land use signs on them and they're clearly going to get developed. And it seems like the developers are moving all the tenants out, and it seems like it could be kind of an unintended consequence of some tighter tenant controls. So it seems like a lot of the developers are just electing to vacate buildings, you know, maybe even a half a year or a year before development. It seems like there's a decent amount of stock in the city that's just not available. And, and is a, um, it seems like a short-term solution, but there's a lot of people who don't have housing. Has there been given any consideration to maybe incentivize developers or ease up the rules or, or do something so those developers can, because I'm sure they'd like to have the income if, if it could work within their plans, but if it's going to somehow trigger a delay in them starting, they don't want to do it, so they're probably afraid of that. Is there any consideration for putting some of those buildings to use or just sitting idle? Not that I'm aware of on the idle buildings. You might have another option for that. I will say that... Um, as the legislature sort of kicks off, kicks into gear, um, there are some things that the city is, is in collaboration with other cities starting to have the conversations about, and one of them is a property tax exemption. They're actually in the bill moving to the state right now. Okay. Oh, yeah. One of the other things is if you're in a property that's getting, if you're, say you're month to month, and then they say you can't, we're not going to renew it for next month, but they're going to turn the building down to develop it. Then you can apply for relocation money. Right. Okay. Actually, the developer has to pay. All right. Who else has questions here who hasn't <laughs> asked a question yet on this side? Anyone who hasn't asked a question yet? Anyone who hasn't asked a question yet here? All right. Ginny and Jim, because we only have five more minutes, and Tamsin. How soon are they thinking talk about Talk louder, please. When do you think, or when are they, they just talking about the zoning, uh, zoning changes? Uh, when, when are those supposed to be implemented? Are we looking at two years from now, maybe? Or are we looking at 10 years? What's, what's the plan on rezoning? That's the conversation that we're going to start in June of this year, and the estimated time that we will have a, a finished proposal to go to council is going to be early 2017. Jim? Yeah, you stated the permits are already been approved for development. They're not going to be covered by the fees. Are you doing anything to prohibit 
The new mandatory housing affordability program is the one you're talking about because they are paying the other fees that we talked about. So I would say, yeah, no. There's no attempt to try and discourage that or say, we're going to hold more touring for a while and we get these recommendations on the ground. No. Tamsin. Yeah, I just had a quick question. Oh, did I answer that wrong, Nick? No. no. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. He was just, he was standing up, so it was like, did I? Tamsin. Does he need to add something? No. Nick, talk loud. There are some projects that, depending on where they are in the permit process, um, are considering actually waiting. Because it's not just a fee that takes into effect with mandatory housing affordability. There's also a zoning change that for certain projects they actually see as. So there's no zoning change either. You don't have to have the science to develop with them. Correction before you. I take it that if there's no zoning change, there's no effort to try and sort of develop and try and put it together before right. the no. recommendations take place. None. Okay. okay. Tamsin, last question here. Okay. I just had a, a question regarding the uh, community engagement piece. Mm -hmm. How are you deciding where you're going to do the community engagement? What groups are you going to be using Good in question. each area? You said, you said north, south, and central, and south is really southeast, southwest. Well, you know, so is north, but yeah. 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 <laughs> Pesky I-5. <laughs> How are you making your decision about who you're going to get engaged in? So when I said north, central, and south, I was talking specifically about the telephone town halls. And so that is us calling people where in their homes. So it doesn't, the, the I-5, the peskiness of I-5 isn't as big a deal. But um, is, it is our intention to be in lots of places and lots of, you know, not just to be in just downtown, not just to be in North Seattle. If we've come out to Morgan Junction, it's very likely that we will ask West Seattle Junction to host us the next time. Um, we are going to, you know, do our best to try to make it geographic. I think the thing that... Um, is going to be a challenge is the raw number of people that are going to want us to come. And so that's really my challenge back to you all, is how can we work together to make sure that everybody hears what they need to hear. And part of that will be not depending on things like this entirely, right? So it will be surveys that are online. It will be, um, you know, potentially even like a televised town hall that people could write into. I'm still working on that one, Speaking so don't.